and we're going to talk about our applied electroacoustic research, uh, focusing on um, what we've put together actually for the impact case study for the new REF. Um, and actually, this builds on some of the work that was an impact case study uh, for REST 2014 as well, and, and that went very well. So, uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today. So next slide, please, Nick. So what we're going to talk about today is the democracy of sound, and Adam's going to talk a little bit about what that means in the next slide. Um, so, um, and actually, our impact case study is, is is shaped into three main themes, which all overlap and actually draw from each other in some way, shape, or form, but have all elicited impact um, internationally um, in in different companies, actually, and with different practitioners. Um, so we'll start to talk about that now. So next slide, please, Nick. Right. So when Bruce and I started to put together our, our current impact case study for REF, uh, we had to figure out a way to be able to, to make our research coherent because um, we kind of work in two separate corners of the audio industry. Uh, but we realized that we really were working towards the same goal with our research, which is broadly the democracy of sound, which means uh, we're trying to deliver a consistently high quality and safe listening experience for everyone listening to sound. And that may be at a massive music festival or in a huge sports arena or someone sitting in the room listening to headphones, something streaming over the internet. So it's really giving everyone the equal chance to, to hear something really amazing. And that's something that our current uh, sound delivery systems just can't do. So the research generally is focusing on first understanding the challenges uh, of sound reinforcement and reproduction, what's going wrong, how can we fix it, and then really trying to optimize the systems in a practical way that can be used immediately by practitioners uh, to make a real difference for audiences. So as Bruce said, I mean, a lot of the research dates back to the last round of REF. Uh, I know Bruce has been researching this area for what, over 20 years now. Uh, I don't think I can claim to be going that long, but uh, maybe 10, 15 years. Uh, but it is well established, I think, in our respective audio engineering fields. Um, you know, we are known as experts in very specific areas. Uh, so our impact has become well established and international in reach. So next slide, please. So as you can see from this side, this slide, this is just an example of some of the companies um, that have benefited from our work, either directly or indirectly, actually. And we're going to talk about some of these today. Um, but also some, you know, some companies we work with aren't included in the, ca the case study or they've been historically used. Um, and actually our, our work goes between sort of festivals, uh, as Adam said, using headphone type listening on YouTube, uh, VLC media player, using software like Reaper, speaker companies like Function One, um, working with actually um, some of the um, societies like the Audio Engineering Society or the Institute of Acoustics when it might be guest talks or tutorials and that kind of thing, or, or actually sometimes directly with bands like the Prodigy, um, which again, we'll, we'll bring up examples of that uh, in a moment. Uh, next slide, please, Nick, I think, unless Adam wants to add anything to that slide. No, that's fine. <laughs> so in general, what we're going to talk about tonight and just give you a really kind of quick whistle top stop tour uh, of what we do. Uh, we have three impact themes that generally uh, encapsulate our work. Uh, first is expanded and enhanced creative immersive audio technology. What does that mean? Uh, essentially, it's 3D audio. It's something beyond just listening to speakers in front of you, uh, which has pretty much been the case for about, what, 50, 60 years. Uh, so that's a lot to do with Bruce's work, taking audio to the next step and making it a bit more exciting. Uh, second is enhanced live event listening experiences, so making going to gigs much better. Uh, and third is improving uh, the understanding of health-related aspects of sound. You know, uh, and I'll talk about later what this is, but really uh, it's about making sure audiences are safe at events. Next slide, please. OK, and be before we actually talk about the research and the research is obviously a really important aspect of our work and something that we you know that, that drives us in terms of writing papers and giving presentations, but actually a really important aspect of any impact uh, of any impact that's going to happen is the enablers of that impact. Because it's not just the research and actually there's really important things uh, that we both do and other, you know, other people at the university also do to 
encourage the impact to actually happen because it, it sometimes happens a bit by accident but you have to put things in place in order to get the work and the knowledge out there so, so just this slide is really just some examples of that so for example we've run a research symposium here at derby called sounds in space since about 2011 we've run it every year except this year where we didn't run it because obviously the the covid restrictions because it happens in june uh, and that's where Actually, a, a, you know, quite a long time ago now, we, us as a research group at the time, were working in 3D audio and doing, you know, what we thought was lots of interesting things. And we struggled actually to have meetings. So we, we decided to have a big meeting, really, at the end of the year and then thought, well, actually, if we demonstrate some of the things we're doing, and this was actually across arts and uh, engineering at the time, um, you know, we could actually turn this into a research symposium. So we started this uh, mini conference, really in 2011 and it's gone from strength to strength ever since. Uh, the picture on that slide is actually the, the Auditorium 3 at Mark Eaton Street that we set up for this particular event. And we normally have between 20 and 30 loudspeakers set up in that room uh, that enables like really high quality three dimensional audio to be reproduced at the conference live. Uh, and that was a really novel thing at the time was actually having good quality audio at an audio conference. It sounds odd, but that that was a novelty at the time. And actually, we got quite a name um, throughout the world and we get researchers from all over the world coming in. We've had the BBC come in. We've had um, Pottermore, so the Harry Potter the 3D audio rendition actually at Derby that we weren't allowed to tell anyone about. It's the only other place it happened in the world other than London. Um, because then there was various legal things as to why we couldn't tell anyone about it at the time. Um, but actually that really helped get the word out there about some of the things we were doing and get other people in to talk to them about. We also produce software tools that implement some of the things we research. So uh, we talk about the algorithms of 3D audio or reproducing sound in large spaces. Um, but then if you've just got a research paper, no one can really use it unless they're also a researcher. So creating software tools that allows students and other people to use that uh, in, a, in a sort of more useful way is really important. And to go alongside that, also blog posts and tutorials and all the other things that makes all that stuff more accessible. Again, research papers are great. Uh, you might have lots of equations in them and make them sound very academic, but that's not great for getting impact on its own. You need to allow other people to uh, weigh into that technology so they can actually use it. And then there's the usual things like conference presentations, which then hopefully leads to invited talks and you know being in a leadership position, whether it's leading a research group or leading uh, something uh, more internationally in terms of some of the Adams work in the AES and their noise control. But actually, there's a lot of work that goes alongside actually doing the research that enables impact and some of the impact that we're going to talk to you about today. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so the first subject is actually um, some of the work I've been doing. As Adam mentioned, um, I've been looking at uh, immersive audio now for uh, over 20 years. I started and, and completed my PhD here at Derby, as it happens. Uh, started that in 99, so I've been here a long time. Um, and the goal really of this research is, as mentioned there, enable and improve the possibility of transparent immersive audio. Uh, both for they are here and the you are there situation. So really what I'm trying to do is fool people into thinking there is sound coming from places that there is not sound coming from. Uh, the image behind me that you can see actually is our, is our research surround lab at the University of Derby, a uh, little bit nicer than it is normally for a photo shoot, but nonetheless, this is one of the labs we work on. Uh, and actually the idea is, so for people using headphones, you want to make it, if they've just got headphones on, uh, an augmented reality type situation where you want to make it sound like there's something in the room that they're currently in, um, but as isn't really there. So some of the work we're currently doing is trying to fool people into thinking that they can almost touch that particular audio object because we've got head tracking, whether that's using a webcam or using some other gyroscopes and whatnot. Uh, so that's the that's the augmented reality or the they are here. And then the other way is the, is the you are there. So if you think about virtual reality where you put on a whole headset and you uh, you take out the vision element and you replace the vision with something else, you're trying to transport the listener into somewhere where they're currently not. And again, audio is actually a really good way of um, fooling people into think thinking things that are happening that aren't really there. Uh, and, and it's well known that actually in the computer gaming industry that really good audio will make the graphics look better. So audio never gets the never gets the praise. It's always, oh, the graphics were amazing. Yeah, we just changed the audio, but there we go. Um, so some of the research that went into this uh, subject over the years has been uh, novel 3D reverberation simulation techniques and software. So basically I've created one of the first three dimensional reverberation algorithms or bit of software that was available for people to use. There was a lot of debate at the time as to how best to do it and I got so fed up with people arguing about it I just made one um, and then just let people use it and actually that was some of the things that enabled some of the early practitioners at YouTube 
uh, in YouTube when they were doing 360 videos that I'll talk about in a moment to actually create mixes for, for new formats. Um, in my PhD, I documented some of the first published methods for deriving psychoacoustically optimized surround decoders for irregular speaker arrays, which is uh, what Paul was talking about earlier, uh, <laughs> which in layman's terms is basically just trying to make the, the surround audio that comes out of speakers, no matter where they are, sound better. That's essentially what it's doing. The psychoacoustics is we need to know, you know, something about the, the system we're trying to fool, which is the ear brain system. It's not just the signals received by the ear. It's actually how we process it. And there's a lot of psychology in there as well uh, in, in the psychoacoustics in trying to work out how we can fool that mechanism. Uh, there's some shortcuts we can take and some we can't. Um, and then some of my later work that we're looking at now, and actually this is what the little animated GIF is on the on the screen, is looking at what are called high order approximation of head related transfer functions and their use in head tract oralization. So if you if you know anything about virtual reality, then the headsets uh, or actually just your phone can track the orientation of the user, and we can do things to. Uh, alter the audio to make the audio track with the user and there are ways of doing it that are sort of computationally expensive um, and there are ways that are doing it that are much more efficient uh, and it's actually looking at that trade-off how can we get something really efficient to work on a mobile phone or something similar but still give a good indication um, that there is a, an audio source in front of you that isn't really there so the augmented reality type thing uh, next slide please nick so the that's the, the research in, in in a very short nutshell really um, so in terms of applications of the impact, well, YouTube actually released, uh, started the ball rolling really in um, 2016 when they enabled uh, immersive audio onto their 360 videos. So 360 videos is basically a video you can watch on YouTube and you can navigate to look at any direction. So the videos happened first. Uh, they then enabled audio that happened to be based on um, the, the technique that I was actually carrying out research into as well. Um, so I already had tools that I'd let students use and other people around the world use and tutorials to go with it that enabled early adopters of that technology to actually produce videos for that format. So one of the first and second videos ever produced for YouTube in that format were using some of the software that I'd created a few years earlier because there just wasn't anything out there at the time because YouTube had released it without uh, the companies having time to catch up. Uh, also, reverse engineered what YouTube did because I knew what they were doing in their particular algorithm and managed to improve it because actually initially it didn't sound that great. Um, so the little picture on the top right there is an inverse filter that I created to basically fix the sound in YouTube 360 videos and a lot of again early adopters use that to actually make their, their videos sound much better. And again these are just things that we released on the web and got in you know in the sort of research circles got talking to people finding the practitioners getting into a dialogue of what they needed uh, and looking at what the problems were to try and get that impact going basically uh, and then vlc media player um so once 360 videos were enabled they might they're mostly designed for headphone uses actually so for personal listening uh, and vlc media player allowed uh, those videos to be played over loudspeakers and it's the only media player that will do it and they needed some numbers that would allow them to optimize this particular uh, setup for a standard 5.1 or a 7.1 home theater array. Uh, so they came to me and said, look, we need some numbers. We know you can make us these numbers. Can you give us some? To which I obviously said yes, as uh, VLC has got over 3 billion downloads later. I thought that probably would be quite good impact. Um, so since version three, they've got some of my numbers and you can see on the bottom left there, me uh, having a credit in the, um, in the in the source code for VLC now uh, that enables uh, listeners to actually listen to those 360 videos over uh, loudspeakers, which wasn't possible and still isn't possible using any other bit of software for consumers actually. Um, so that, that in a nutshell is some of the stuff um, I've been doing with immersive audio. Uh, next slide, please, Nick. Right, so the second uh, kind of theme of impact uh, that, that kind of bridges uh, Bruce and my research um, is live event listening experiences, uh, which is sort of sad to talk about now just because we're without live events and probably will be uh, for the next at least half year. Um, but really the general goal from all the research that kind of pours into this is not necessarily to uh, achieve the same sound level at every seat in the house because that is physically very difficult to do. 
uh, but at least achieve the same tonality. So it sounds the same. The musicality is the same, uh, as well as achieving the same sonic image. So if you want the sound to be sounding like it com coming from just off left, uh, it is in every seat of the house, um, which again feeds a lot into uh, to Bruce's research. Um, the research, uh, Bruce already mentioned his uh, ambisonic system, and that is used at live events as well. I think I'll mention it uh, at some point in the next slide. Uh, but uh, my research tends to focus on maybe less the spatial audio aspect and more just, if you want to call it the brute force uh, of live sound. You know, the thing that's exciting about live sound is the impact. You know, when the drummer hits one of their drums, you physically shake, you feel it. Uh, and I tend to specialize in the low frequency or the bass uh, aspect of uh, sound systems. So I've done quite a work, uh, a bit of work on Sopelford system analysis and optimization um, to the point where, uh, you know, over the summers when festivals are running, I get quite a few emails from system designers saying, here are the Sopelfords we have available, tell us what to do. I'll send them a few numbers, tell them what to do, they implement it and, uh, and everyone seems to be happy. Uh, and then this dynamic diffuse signal processing, I'm not even going to begin to try to explain what it is. In a nutshell, it's if you have multiple speakers outputting the same audio, they interfere with each other. And this is a signal processing uh, approach to avoiding that interference issue, making everything sound the same everywhere in the audience. Uh, so next slide, please. So applications, uh, I think we have some fairly exciting applications uh, for this stream of research. Uh, I'll let Bruce talk in a little bit on uh, his exciting work at Glastonbury. Um, for me, uh, I've worked for over 10 years now at Pitchfork Music Festival in Chicago, which draws about 60,000 people annually. Uh, I've gained their trust, the people who put on Pitchfork, uh, to the point where the company I work for in Chicago designs and operates the sound systems on their two main stages. Um, you'll see a photo from the fest from a few years back on that the top photo. Uh, but they trust me now enough to the point where they let me do experiments during the festival, and they know I'm not going to completely destroy everything or make it sound horrible. So the past maybe four or five years, I go there every summer with my research equipment and I'm doing experiments there and then as the festival's happening. And I think there are very few opportunities in the world to do that. Um, and it's about building trust and that all feeds back into the research at Darby, while at the same time hopefully giving those tens of thousands of people a great experience uh, listening to live music. Uh, also, one of the last festivals that I was involved with was the Ash Ashley for the Arts Festival that was in the state of Wisconsin, so just north of Chicago, uh, last summer, where I didn't set foot on that site. Uh, the chief engineer of the sound company that was uh, providing for that festival just got in touch, said, here's our system specs, this is what we have, make it work. And so I ran some simulations on my software, sent him over the information, and he came back saying, I don't know what you did, but the engineers were absolutely raving about this. They said it was the best sound they had with the low frequencies. Uh, they were really happy. Um, so there's a lot of examples of things like that. Um, we also did some work with the Prodigy. Uh, my relationship with them goes back about five years. Uh, like I said, I'm kind of known for for getting the bass quality at events sounding really good. Um, and I got to talking to John Burton, um, who is their longtime front of house engineer, uh, who consequently now works at the University of Derby. Uh, he retired from the road, uh, seems to be good timing, uh, looking at it now. Uh, and he joined our academic team uh, since he had done an MRS at York. But he officially brought me on uh, for the No Tourist Tour, which is the last tour that the Prodigy did um, before, uh, tragically, their lead singer um, lost his life. Uh, but I helped him design the sound system with that and really achieve the best impact uh, you can um, with the sound system, which was very successful. Uh, aside from that, I've worked with companies like Alto Aviation. They do private and corporate aircrafts, uh, so not a live events, but I'm using the same technology uh, with a bit of machine learning to make it sound great in every seat of these private aircrafts for uh, the rich and famous. Uh, and then lastly, uh, one of the most recent bits of impact was um, on this diffuse signal processing research. Uh, I had a PhD student who worked on this and we managed to get the algorithm to the point where it was ready to put into place in a real venue. Uh, so it is actually up and running at the National Library of New Zealand, it's halfway around the world, uh, making their auditorium for speech and small music events uh, actually uh, sound 
quite good, at least from the feedback um, that we've received. Um, so, you know, kind of that's my bit for the live sound. I mean, Bruce, do you want to say anything about Glastonbury? Um, I, I can do, yeah. So um, Function One was a, a company that used to run stages at Glastonbury, well, still do run stages at Glastonbury and uh, actually used to do all the sound at uh, an event called Glade Festival. And we trialed um, our immersive sound over six very large speakers at Glastonbury and found uh, at Glade Festival initially and found that the sound was the best quality on site as voted by the punters. It was the loudest on site, but the quietest off site. And so actually since then, they've been using um, some of my software at the Glastonbury Festival every year from that point, which was about 2008, say, um, until until last year, which was the, the last year that Glastonbury's run because it didn't run this year. Um, so actually, um, and again, that's a good example of how some of our research crosses over um, in terms of this uh, case study. So next slide, I think, Nick. OK, so we're nearing the end here. I know I'm conscious of time, so I won't spend too long in this. But the third and final aspect of our um, our research that we do is health aspects of sound exposure. And this is something that I really, to be honest, didn't care that much about until maybe three or four years ago. Um, you know, I was quite happy to build these sound systems that were real, super, really super loud and you know, thought it was great. Um, but I did get eventually get pulled into this initiative with the World Health Organization uh, looking into making listening safe. It's their making listening safe initiative and actually trying to protect audiences uh, going to all sorts of different venues uh, around the world to make sure they can enjoy themselves without absolutely blowing out their hearing. Uh, so a lot of the research has gone into making sure audiences are safe uh, and to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. The front row of an audience at a music festival, based on my measurements, is receiving at peak about 140 dB uh, of sound energy, which the only published work I could find on it was from NASA, from the studies they did in the Apollo missions when they were strapping people to rockets and sending them into space. So that's about the same sound pressure level if you're strapped to an old Apollo rocket going into space as you are in the front row of a music festival. So a few alarm bells went off, uh, let's say. So we've looked into that. Uh, we've also looked into festivals happening near people's dwellings where people live. Uh, and we're looking at ways to really best practice to minimize annoyance in the community so we can coexist having these big events and having people living there and everyone's happy. Easier said than done. Uh, and then lastly, uh, just through uh, a contact. I have an industry who's very involved with speech intelligibility. Uh, we've started to pick apart the methods for quantifying speech intelligibility, which is really important in public address systems. Think about if you're on the tube in London. If there was a fire in there, you need to know that you have to get out of there. And there have been big disasters in the past where that hasn't been able to happen. Speech intelligibility is something that's required by law um, to be at a certain good enough level so that people can hear emergency announcements uh, if there's a reason for them to uh, get out of somewhere because there's a problem. Um, so with the AES, the Audio Engineering Society, uh, I think I effectively ended up doing another PhD uh, over the past few years where it was a massive literature review uh, and a bit of uh, original research just looking across the world, seeing how we're managing sound exposure on site and noise pollution offsite at big outdoor events and kind of highlighting best practice. Um, so this was done with about 14 other people around the world. So some academics, some uh, members of industry, uh, and it ended up being about 150 page technical document. And it's the first time to my knowledge that noise regulations around the world have been actually compiled into a single document. Um, and it, it's been quite a good reference document uh, for members of industry. So that was released in May of this year. Uh, the next slide, please. And then um, a couple other, um, again, standards that have come out based on the research uh, relating specifically to speech intelligibility have been one through the IEC and one through British standards. Uh, the British standards one was uh, a code of practice for designing and specifying sound systems in uh, public buildings and venues. Uh, so some of that research in basically we found some flaws in the way speech intelligibility is quantified uh, for fairly major flaws actually. So that's made it into the standards um, 
basically saying, look, here's a problem. If you encounter these situations, this is what you need to do. And similarly with the IEC standard, it's um, we're one of only, I think, five papers referenced in there. I should say that's one of our undergrad students who is the lead author on uh, that conference paper that's referenced at an international standard, which I, I'm very proud of. Um, he stayed on to do a master's and now a PhD with us, and he's doing very well. Uh, and then just lastly, it's this Make Listening Safe initiative with the WHO. Um, I think that really has the chance for the most impact out of anything with this research. Um, I was in Geneva this past February where it's a roundtable discussion, um, all sort of different stakeholders with live events uh, and um, kind of uh, mobile listening devices where we're really trying to give create an international regulatory framework uh, for basically to make things safe. Any way you listen for entertainment, make it safe. That's hopefully coming out next year and that will be international in scope. Uh, so that's that's us and uh, thanks for listening.